Yes, some people will go after the same opportunity. Fine. Remember, we're bidding anyway. So that means we're already in competition for contracts because we're bidding. That's the first thing. But an oversaturated market in federal government contract, it can't even happen. There's too many opportunities. 96,365, whatever that number is, is crazy. You said 96,000 every day, every single day. Not 9,600, 96,000 every day, every single day. Every we gotta put that. We gotta put that stat back up because we put per year. It's ninety six thousand every day, every day. Yeah, ninety six thousand federal government contracting opportunities every single day. So there's no way that it, even if. What's good? What's good? What's good, everybody? Yo, we are here with another episode of Entrepreneurship Exposed with your guy, Bees, Business Builder Bees, Business Buyer Bees. Let's go. (laughs) So today we are joined by a really good friend of mine. Uh, This dude is an upstanding dude. He is, uh, you know, we we met each other during the clubhouse days. (laughs) Clubhouse days, man. That was some fun times. A lot of uh, networking going on virtually. We were still in somewhat of a lockdown and all of that. Uh, and, you know, we imme- immediately uh, connected, resonated with each other. Uh, and he always tells a story about he, he likes to double check and make sure people are what they say they really are. So he pulled up on me in, in South Florida. And, you know, he tell you that I was who I said I was. <laughs> uh-huh. Today, we're going to get into exposing the world of government contracting, the art of the middleman. So shout out to our guest today, my guy, Jay White, Jason White, first name, last name. Let's go. What's good, brother? My God, bees, man. What's happening, man? It's a long time coming. This little sit down for for the public, this has been a long time coming. We always have sit downs and conversations, but to expose it like this, this is good. This is this is gonna be dope. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Definitely, man. It's a long time coming, and, and like you said, we talk all the time. We we're yeah. doing different deals. We, we you know making things, seeing how we could connect, work with each other, yes, expand sir. programs, bring more people in. We doing all type of stuff all the time, but you know, on an official basis on the podcast, you know, this is the first, and it, 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 you know, not the last as well. Yes, but my sir. brother, hey, tell the people a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Man, I'm I'm Jay White, first name, last name. Y'all see what the topic of discussion is, is the art of the middleman, right? So I get the federal government contracts and I subcontract them out. I don't see the work. I don't touch the work. I don't see the workers that actually do the work either. So when we talk about really middlemaning and facilitating a deal, I'm doing that with federal government contracting and I'm doing it consistently and getting a residual income from the federal government. There we go. There we go, bro. How did you come up with this? Like, what what made that? Where'd you get the idea for, for to even do this? Yeah, bro. So I entrepreneurship and all this fell in my lap in 2008. I definitely wasn't looking for to be a owner. I wasn't looking to have a business. I didn't know what an LLC was. And that people laugh when I say, hell, I did. In 2008, I was too far in the street life. And then I was, at that moment in time, I had just got released from the brig. So I was just working my gas station job and just good. I was just chilling. Um, but my homeboy is the one that introduced me to federal government contracting. And then he couldn't even really teach me. So I had to teach myself. But that's how I got introduced to it. Yeah, man. Okay, okay. Well, see, I, now the public doesn't know this, not not everybody, but we did a tour yeah. recently, right? Yes, and it's the, the first one of many to come. We were just testing out the waters. It was a yeah. three-city, three-day tour. <laughs> and what was the name of that tour? The Above Us Tour, baby. The, the Above, Above Us, Us Tour. tour. Uh-huh. And, and, and tell the people why was government contracting a part of the Above Us Tour? Because most people don't consider government contracting as a way to make income and definitely not as a way to make residual income because they think it's above us. They think it's above them. Like, all right. He doing that's cool. I'm going to stay in my lane. I can't get to that level. 
So I'm not even going to try. They think it's over their head because the federal government has all this jargon. They got all this confusing documentation that you got to go through. So most people feel like it's above them and they can't do it. So one of the reasons why we created the tool and federal government contracting was a big piece of it um, is simply because I know how to break the information down so you and anybody else that romance the thought of doing government contracting can feel like, hey, I can do this. I can get it done. If this dude did it, I barely graduated high school, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got my PhD, baby. I got my public high school diploma. So I tell people that. So if I can do it, they definitely can do it. And the way I deliver the information makes it an obtainable goal for them. That, that right there is the most important part, man. Because Okay, before we get to the episode, I just had to take a moment to say thank you to everybody that's been supporting Entrepreneurship Exposed. Your guy B's here and, you know, just having a great time having these conversations, showing you every aspect of entrepreneurship. Because there's a lot of things out there that are, you know, seems like all the glitz and the glam, everything looks good. But we want to make sure that you see some of the obstacles, not things that will stop you, but just things that you need to know before you dive into this world of entrepreneurship. If you like this content, you like these videos, please just do me a favor and just make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure that you click the like button, comment on it. Just tell me what you feel about each topic so I'll know how to adjust for other topics and have other guests on. And make sure that you hit the notification bell because YouTube's kind of weird like that. And if you don't have that notification bell, even if you're subscribed to me, you won't see a lot of my content. All right. So if you would like to support us, that would be the best way. Thank you so much. Now back to the In the Above Us tour. I was also a part of it. And yes, I was were. speaking about how to acquire businesses, especially yes, for no money out of your pocket. Right. And most people forget about the no money out of your pocket part. Just right. buying a business. They're like, what? Oh, wow. That's amazing. Bees, you're a genius. I'm like, no, right. I'm not. I'm not a genius. <laughs> they say, oh, nobody's talking about these type of things in our community, maybe. Yeah. But a lot of people, are, you know, in other communities are talking about it. This is a, something that's been going on for centuries, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the fact that, or the reason why people really resonate with me and they're like, okay, they think they can potentially do it now is because I simplify, yeah. right? And I think that's where you and I ended up resonating a lot with because yeah. you do the same from the government contracting side. You simplify it for the mm -hmm. average person to be like, yo, okay. This makes sense. You know, There's no way we, we think about this all the time. I mean, I've heard you speak numerous times. You heard me speak numerous times. There's no way we can possibly take a, a topic like government contracting and continue to give government jargon to people that's never heard of it. You mm -hmm. got to break it down to the simplest form. So even if somebody is remotely interested, they're interested based off of how you deliver the information so they can easily digest it. So then they can make a decision. Oh, yeah, I want to rock with it. Or not, nah, it's still not for me. But we can't be, most people confuse people by using big words and all this acronyms and stuff like that. You ain't going to get nowhere like that. You ain't get yeah, nowhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. And, and we have to also take the onus on ourselves too, though, because I, I gave an example the other day. I, was, I, I don't remember. It might have been during my Motivational Monday talk or something. Yeah. And I was saying that, you know, how many people have, life insurance plans, right? And then I said, how many, you know, how many people had a, even your credit card, when you get your credit card, it comes with like this packet of all mm -hmm. the information and the benefits that you get in your, your credit card, right? Mm -hmm. But how many people actually read that? <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And then how many people go and get those benefits? Yeah. yeah. It tends to be the wealthy who, who do that. You would mm -hmm. think it's the opposite. You would think that the wealthy, oh, they don't care about the benefits. Mm -hmm. Nah, that's why they wealthy, because they always care about the details. Details. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. they'll go through and say, oh, I get a $200 credit for my um, global entry when I, I use global entry. So yeah, let me do that. Let me make sure I use this credit card when mm -hmm. I'm uh, buying global entry, because they'll give me the credit back for it. Right? Right. Little right. things like that, it, it, those details where we can't be afraid mm -hmm. to read these things that's in there, reading those government contracts and not being afraid of the jargon, trying right. to figure out, hey, what does it mean? But then also, yeah, on the other side, from a teaching perspective, we got to try to simplify things to make right. it easier for people. So, so yeah. I love that, you know, you do on both sides of that, man. Yeah, and that's bro, a great yeah. example for everybody. Yeah. That's right. We, I, I, understanding that I can only teach this, though, bro, because I went through and still currently I am getting federal government contracts. So I don't teach it just, 
that's because I read about it or I did it one time. I've been doing this since 2008. It's 2022. So that's real tenure. That's real situations, ups and downs, highs and lows. That's being consistent. That's understanding uh, the world will change. So that means contracting will change, being abreast on what the new rules are, the regulations. That's a, that's a, that's a whole thing. But now, like you just talked about, what type of information to read, what details to actually provide anybody so they can execute. Most people ain't. That's a skill. That's a, actually a learned skill that you have to have. Most people don't cultivate that skill before they start to teach somebody anything. There you go. For real, brother. And 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 not just cultivate the skill before you start teaching, but continue to enhance the skill while you're teaching. Yes, right. Sir. And again, I feel that's another thing that we resonate well on because for, for us, we're doing these things right now, acquiring mm -hmm. businesses right now. You get in government contracts right now. So each week when you teach your students, for example, mm -hmm. you may be giving them something new that you learned as well because you came across a new type of contract mm -hmm. where the government's changing this. Lately, what, what was it that happened? Uh, the, uh, uh, San, uh, the government didn't require DUNS numbers anymore. Yeah, so yeah, so that changed. So that changed to a UEI number. You got to be abreast on that type of stuff because if not, and somebody come asking you, like, hey, what's a UEI number? What's that? And if I say, well, I don't know, and I gotta look it up. Am I really, am I, am I really who I say I am? Am I really doing this for real? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So it's a thing to be it's, it's a thing to provide current real-time information when you get into the space of teaching and, and helping shape the minds of people that's trying to get into whatever space that they're in or getting there into. There we go. There we go. So and speaking of teaching. Right. Yeah. So we've been talking about what you've been doing. And then we also mentioned that you're teaching. But can you tell tell us about your uh, program that you have where you're teaching? What's the name of that program? And oh, man. Oh, it's the federal code. <laughs> man. You know what I'm saying? You so, your merch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's a program that we that we created to make sure that people can learn federal government contracting. Number one. In its rarest form, number two, on their own time. There's a lot of times that people come out with certain things, but you're on somebody else's time. Or you only got the program for 30 days. Now, nah. mm. you purchase a program, you got it, you got to execute it. But we did it so you can do it on your own time. But I always encourage people, once you start it, go ahead and see it through and get going. So it's just a program where, because of based off of my success that I've had since 2008, I just put it into a program and then I teach my students through that. I have a weekly Zoom call every Wednesday at 8 p.m. I do Ask Me Anything Fridays just for the love on IG. And mm -hmm. then I do, I do, I go around to certain cities and I just do live workshop where I teach the process in real time right in front of you. Jay White stand right in front of you. Come on with it. There you go. There you go. I love it, man. And shout out to everybody in the comments that we see right here that's uh, attending this special viewing. Uh, yeah. Event. For real, I see I see some some of your students, some of my students in there as well. What so. up? What up? <laughs> that's what's up? That's what's up. So now we gotta get to the sauce, bro. We gotta get to the sauce because my my listeners are they, they they already know most of them already know about some of these different uh, entrepreneurial strategies. Yeah. Or some of them they're they're trying to figure out where what path they want to take. So we give them the real on entrepreneurship exposed, and mm -hmm. we are going to pop the bubble. Yeah. of government contracting, right? Yeah. Now, what does that mean? I want to get into the pros of this game, right? right. The pros of this strategy. I want to get into the opportunities that exist that are coming up that is going to make it explode even more. But most importantly, we got to get into the problems. So okay. give people some things that they, they, they should be looking out for if they're going to get into this space. So yeah. go ahead, man. Lead, lead that conversation and let us know what, how we could pop this book. All right, all right, so what's the first thing? The pros, that's Pro. easy. That's too easy. Is the federal government is the largest supplier and purchaser in the world. That instantly means it's an unlimited checkbook. So there's an endless supplies of opportunities that total small businesses or businesses as a whole can procure a product or a service for the federal government. The second pro is the way I teach federal government contracting is as the middle man or middle woman, you're not touching the work. So you're you're merely just getting the federal government contract and then subcontracting it out, which means you don't have to be near it, around it, see it, even understand it. You don't even have to understand it either. You just be have to be able to articulate what the expectations is from the federal government to the company that's actually going to do the work 
on your federal government contract. So I think based off of those two pros right there, that's enough. And then I'm going to say this too. Most, most of the contracts, federal government contracts that I teach my students to go for is a three, four, or five-year run. So that means you're getting paid residually off of a federal government contract for the next three or four or five years for work that you're not doing. Now, imagine you got 10 of those and you got, and each one of those is $1,000. Let me just do low numbers. It's $1,000. That's $10,000 a month from 10 different federal government contracts for work you ain't doing. I don't know nobody that don't want to get involved in something like that. So Ooh. those are the big, big pros right there. Okay, me. okay, okay. Lead, lead us into the opportunities now. What's coming yeah. up in this space that we definitely got to look out for? That's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. So I always like to understand the way of the world, what's happening in the world. So when COVID was popping off, the biggest opportunities then was PPE, personal protective equipment, gloves, gowns, and masks. So that wave has slowed down. Now we're entering, now we're entering back into the wave of security because we all know what's happening with with Russia and Ukraine and all of that. So right now, the federal government is ramping on security as a whole, physical and uh, intellectual property security. So your IT services contracts, they're going to be big. Your physical security, manned, armed and unarmed guard securities, that's going to be big. Whether you're guarding property, buildings or people, because congressmen and congresswomen, they need security detail as well. Those contracts are definitely coming up and they heavy. Actually, they're here right now. They heavy right now. Okay, okay. That's what's up. Great yeah. opportunity there. Security's always been, and you yeah. know, the US is gonna spend tons of money on anything related money. to security. Yeah, so. money. yeah. And then you all you always got your you always got your your regulars. I like to call them low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Your lawn care, your janitorial, your trucking, your construction, your your uh wig making, your pencils and pit pads, notepads. All that stuff is a constant in the federal government. So that's there. When we talk about upcoming opportunities, it's definitely security. Okay, okay. And, okay. and now we got to get to the cons, man. That's the most <laughs> important thing. Tell me, tell me, what are the things that people need to look out for and beware of getting into this space? Yeah, so we keep it a thousand. We're going to continue to keep it a thousand. So in this, in this space of middle manning, you got to be aware of your consistency or the lack thereof, right? Because if you're not making phone calls, that means you're not getting quotes. That means you're not submitting proposals. So you got to be aware of your consistency, number one. That's a big, big con. If you're not consistent, you're probably not going to do as well as you probably should. That's the first thing. Number two, you got to get out your comfort zone of being able to talk on the phone. Most people are uh, uh, finger Twitter heavy. They just want to email you to death because they're so corporate. So communication or the lack of communication is a con for most people because they don't know how to properly have human to human interaction. If you don't know how to properly have human to human interaction, you probably won't be as successful in this space as quickly as you can be because of the lack or just the no knowledge of not being able to properly communicate and have human to human interaction. Also, here's another big con when it comes to contracting itself if you don't understand pricing you're going to lose a lot of bids that you place so you got to quickly be able to understand what pricing looks like yes you heard me say the federal government is the largest purchaser in the world but if you don't understand what pricing looks like to that customer with the large wallet then they're not opening up that wallet or pocketbook for you mm. so you got to be able to understand pricing you got to be able to properly communicate you got to be have a high level of consistency. If you don't have those things, those are the cons and pitfalls that most people trip over or run into every single time. Oh my goodness! Okay, I love that. So, so tell me this though, and I don't know if this is a con or not, but All right. is it okay? My, you know, some of our friends, Maddie J, yeah. uh, Pushman Mitch, they ha they have these courses. They're teaching people how to uh, uh, rent out their cars right, on things like Turo and such, and mm -hmm. it's leading to an influx of people who are renting out their cars, and they're all in similar markets, yeah. and then there's a lot of competition being built up. Yeah. Is the federal code by J. White, first name, last name, 
going to cause an issue like that where everybody's getting into government contracting and now it's over, overly saturated or exactly. too competitive, anything like that? Yeah, here's the thing. So, number one, we all know that when you teach somebody something or when you teach a large group of individuals something, everybody not going to do it. That's the first thing. Everybody not going to see it through. Everybody going to be, it's, it's a shiny new object. They might start it, but they're going to get punched in the face by life and they're going to quit. Right, people. Most people, they got a, a low IQ level. That's not how smart you are. That's your I quit level. They mm. quit so fast. Say that again. So say that again. Like, huh? Say that again. Say that again. <laughs> most people, and because it's a fact, most people in life they got a low IQ level. That's not how smart you are. That's your I quit level. They quit so fast at this small sign of adversity. They did. They just done. They out of here. Or another shiny object looks better to them, so they go over there. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. There's 96,000 federal government contract opportunities, not a month, not a week, but every single day. 96,000 federal government contracting opportunities every single day. Now it's 365 days in a year. If somebody was to do 96,000 times 365, that means there, is, there can be no competition because if or, uh, or oversaturated because there's 96,000 opportunities. Yes, some people will go after the same opportunities. Fine. Remember, we're bidding anyway. So that means we're already in competition for contracts because we're bidding. That's the first thing. But an uh, oversaturated market in federal government contract, it can't even happen. There's too many opportunities. 96,000 times 365, whatever that number is, is crazy. You said 96,000. Every day, every single day, not 9,600, 96,000 nope. every day, every single day. Every no, we got to put that, we got to put that stat back up because we put <laughs> per year. It's 96,000 every day, every day. Yeah, 96,000 federal government contracting opportunities every single day. So there's no way that it, even if I don't know, 16 or 17 percent of the of one race or population coming to federal government contracting, it still don't even matter. It still don't even matter. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it, bro. Okay, so I saw somebody in the chat put um, like what you're talking about sounds like what uh, I advocate for in the BBI, the Business Builders Institute. Okay, okay. Working above the business. Right. And, hey, I don't want to be in the middle of the business. I don't want to be in it. As yeah. an employee or self-employed, I don't even right. want to be on it as a CEO. I want to be above it as an investor. Would right. you say that government contracting is more on it as a CEO, or can you be above it as an investor and hire a CEO in, in place to have it running? So you can do both. So now that I have, uh, I got I was, got forty one. I was going to say forty two, but I just I just uh, didn't get reinstated for another contract uh, yesterday. But anyway. So I got 42 contracts right now total. So when you get to that level, I don't work in my business anymore. I got somebody else to run it. So at that point, I am above my own business. I'm above it. So I just I just get the reports. I, I have the times I don't even read it. And I just get the money, right? <laughs> so, But when you're starting, you have to be the CEO because you have to understand what the process looks like of being awarded a contract, managing the contract after being awarded, understand what it looks like to get those option years uh, carried through for one contract. So you, you can be above it, but when you start, you have to work the business and working the business is merely just project managing the yeah. contracts because there's another company actually doing the physical work on your contract. But in the beginning, yeah, you got to actually work it and manage it properly. But once you get to so many, then you understand what building your team looks like so you can do what you like to do and be above that business. Okay, okay. Now, listen, I always, always steer the conversation towards acquiring business. Right? <laughs> business. Right? Now, you already are exposed to this because you know what I do and you and I have been talking and we're trying to get on some projects to get some businesses yes, bought sir. for you as well, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, yep. what, what are your thoughts on acquiring businesses and would you do it within the government uh, contracting space somehow or just as separate individual businesses that's just going to run, uh, you know, on its own. Yeah, so I would do it both ways because I did it. I didn't even know that I was acquiring business. I tell this story all the time. You heard me. So I went to get a 
a federal government contract for a non-transportation medical contract. Well, I had to reach out to a non, non-emergency uh, transportation companies. So when I did, one guy was like, look, man, I want to do the work, but I want to actually sell my business. I like, well, sell it to me, but can you can you stay there? Like, I don't know how to run that business. Can you stay there? He said, yeah. Now, I didn't use your strategy because I didn't know it. So I bought the business. I bought it at a certain dollar amount. So now I bought that business, but now I've already been awarded the government contract too. So that's my business actually being worked on on my federal government contract. So you could do it that way. And then obviously, I like how you speak about acquiring businesses are separate from federal government contracting because even though the federal government contract space ain't going nowhere, it's always going to be here, but there's businesses that ain't going nowhere either that, that need to be acquired and that you don't have to do anything with. So it's some of the, we teach some of the same principles, actually a lot of the same principles because the mindset, the concept, the communication, the consistency, the pricing, all of those things take place when you're thinking about acquiring a business and if, even if it's feasible to acquire that business. So I would do it both ways, inside and outside the government. I love that. I love that. And we had a great question in the chat too. It said, can we buy into a government contracting company? So not, not the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the subcontractor, but yeah. a company like yours, who's that middleman, can we buy into that? Now I'm assuming the answer is yes. Is if you, if you find one that's selling, right? Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Anything. But is there but, anything that you think people would need to be aware of? Like, it'd be difficult. With it, 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 rights, like, it'd be know. very difficult. It'd be very uh, difficult. Here's why, here's why I say it'd be very difficult. Most middle man or middle woman companies, they're not, advertising at all. You don't even know that they, they have a business or it exists unless you're just having a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So prior to me even being on any social media platforms at all, I, I didn't go around telling people, yeah, I got a business and I got these contracts. People ask me, what do you do? I say, I'm a glorified echo. Like that's all. And they, they laugh all the time and I just brush it off. You know what I'm saying? It's not a big, it's not a big deal. So number one, it'd be hard to find a company like mine to even figure out about acquiring it. Then number two, when you acquire a business like mine, it's transferring contracts and S corps and all that in this type of space, it, it'd be, it'd be, it, it can be done, but it'd just be difficult. Mm, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, so tell me, actually you did mention to me recently about uh, uh, somebody wanting to buy one of your yeah. companies. So you've been on the, hey, I'm a buyer company side, but you've also been on the, yo, I'm selling companies side. Yeah. So, so you want to uh, explain a little bit about that? Or is yeah, it yeah. that's cool. That's cool. Okay. I got, I can do a little bit of it. So from my federal government contract money and all the income that I, and I'm continuing to generate there, I, I'm afforded the opportunity to start businesses that I know have a future long term. I'm all about long term. Because federal government contracting is long term. It's not going away. So I created a company and I'm moving along. I'm, everything is good. Somebody did ask me, what company do you have? And I mentioned that because that's my newest company. When I mentioned that new company to him, this gentleman asked more questions and he, he wanted to, number one, first he wanted to team up. Then based off of the numbers I gave him, he was like, listen, I just want to acquire your business and still give you 30% stake in your business. I said, Ooh. deal. <laughs> <laughs> like, My business ain't even been, it hasn't been in business for two years yet. It's a little less than a year. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to talk about your strategy, B, so, but I know what we, I know what we talk about, right? With your strategy. I think my business to this guy was so attractive because he hadn't, he hadn't started it. He actually wants to work it. He don't want to just be above it. He actually wants to work it. So all he did was acquire all my rights and all my software and licenses so he don't have to start from the ground up. So and that's the, that's, that's the beauty of buying a business, right? Yeah. Yes, I make a business. I make it into a business to buy multiple businesses. Yeah. But you don't have to do that. You could just say, hey, I just want to buy this one business to roll into my current business. Yeah. Well, I just want to buy this one business and work in it because I'm passionate about it. You can do it whichever strategy yeah. that you choose. And that's exactly what this person seems yeah. to be doing. Skipping yeah. that, hey, let me get things together and figure out. And I did. I, all the stuff I did. He skipped the line. He just paid me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's what's up. That's what's up, man. So, so tell me, what would be 
if you and, and don't worry because just like in government contracting, there I focus on motivated sellers in terms okay. of acquisitions, right? Motivated mm-hmm. seller might be someone that's retiring. It may be someone that is, uh, um, they had a breakup and they had a, a, a brick and mortar business and maybe they want to leave the country. Maybe they just got to, they have multiple businesses and they just want to get out of this one because they need to focus on the other ones. The other ones are growing more, but this one was still doing well, right? right? Now, there's 12.5, I think, million baby boomers that have businesses mm. out of the 50 million baby boomers in the country at all. Okay. All of those baby boomers are retiring this decade. It presents a huge opportunity for wealth transfer to acquire businesses, which would have otherwise just potentially just shut down. Yeah. Or they would try to give it to their kids and maybe their kids don't want it. Right. Now, right, right. if you have an opportunity to sell that business, the kid is like, oh, I could get cash out on it. Mm-hmm. So they're motivated sellers, right? So mm-hmm. they're, they're no, there's so much opportunity for acquiring businesses. But here's my question to you. If you were to acquire one and think about anything, what would you think would be one company, a type of company that you'd like to acquire? Especially if you don't got to run, do nothing with it at all. It's just their passion. Mm -hmm. What field, what industry, what type of company do you think you'd want to acquire first? Um, man, yeah, it is a lot of opportunities, but I think I would acquire a mid-level trucking company. Ooh. Yeah, I would acquire a mid-level trucking company. And the reason why I instantly went there, and I say mid-level because I don't need to be crazy, crazy big. I just needed to have, you know, a couple semis on the road, a couple box trucks, a couple uh, little stuff like that. Maybe like 10 semis on the road already and a couple box trucks because federal government contracts always need a truck. I don't care where it's at. They always need a truck. And those contracts are typically for two years. Now, most trucking company contracts, they last, they last based on cross country, they don't last as long as a two year or three year contract. Because mm-hmm. once that load is done or once they do whatever, whatever it is they're doing, then it's pretty much done. So I would do a mid level trucking company and then get government contracts for that business that I just acquired, which is which would be, I love that because now you're looking across, you're looking at verticals and the horizontals, right? And you're saying, Hey, I'm doing these type of things and I know what I need. I can get stuff within my business to, to, to have other revenue streams, or I could control the entire chain, the entire horizontal. So Mm -hmm. I love that, man. That's, that's a smart thing to do. And you don't have to do that. You could just say, I just want a random thing here, there. It has a good multiple, like a selenator for a higher multiple because I have an exit plan. But mm-hmm. I like the, the kind of conglomerate that you're making by choosing things that's in the horizontal. Uh, you know, bro. Yeah. We always got we always got to be two, three, four, five, six, twelve steps ahead, right? If we're not thinking ahead, then we're not properly using. Number one, we haven't unlocked our greatness. That's the first thing. Number two, we're not properly using our resources if we're not thinking vertically and horizontally when a new business opportunity presents itself. Okay, the things that I have going, how can I enhance it? How can I boost it up a little bit more, or how can I marry this one with another opportunity? So I'm always thinking like that. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. And I see some good comments again. Uh, one that's asking, uh, first of all, does your government contracting course help newbies? And, you know, how, where would a newbie start? Yeah, so, the, so man, I, yeah, you know, I hate to talk about my course like this. I ain't no, I'm not a salesy guy. You know that, bro. Yes. I ain't a salesy guy. But that, that is a good question. So the course is built around people that are have no knowledge, the people that have intermediate knowledge and the people that think they're experts. It's built around that. Because if you think you're an expert, now I got to help you unlearn all of the research that you've been doing so you can actually learn this process. If you're a newbie, it's definitely it's definitely uh, one of the best starting points that I've, and obviously I'm doing it, but at, when I look across the board at what other government contracting programs are out there, Mine starts you from the simplest point of how to even get an LLC. Because I, I I built the course talking to my 2008 self, right? So in this module style. So some of the modules, people don't need. You can skip right through it and get right to the, you know, the meat and potatoes. But I'm starting people from, okay, get an LLC. Once you get to a certain dollar amount, now you need to change it to an escort. Like I'm starting you from the ground level. Build a company. Build a company for government contracting. 
Now it's time to understand what the contracts look like and stuff like that. So yeah, it's definitely for newbies, but it's for everybody, whatever your level of knowledge is. Definitely. That's what's up. And another great comment I see is have have a, have a family member acquire the mid-level trucking company, and then they can also secure that 8A status. Can you talk oh, about 8A? Yeah. yeah, please. Let's talk about it. <laughs> I'm, not a, <laughs> I'm not an advocate for 8A. Me personally, I'm not an advocate for it. Can, is 8A beneficial? Yes. Is 8A uh, a decent program? Yes. So we're saying the number eight and we're saying the letter A, 8A. It's a business development program where the federal government wants to build your business to be in a box. They want to have you do just one thing. That's all that's it. You can't go outside of the way they want to develop your company. Now, those are huge, massive contracts. When you hear people talk about government contracting and they say, oh, you can make millions, they're pretty much talking about that, right? The 8A program, which is actually deemed as the minority set aside. So most people don't even put those two together, but that's what the set aside is, 8A program. Now, I'm not an advocate for it, and here's why. Because they want to put me in a box, that's the first thing. I don't want to just go after one type of contract. I want to go after a bunch of uh, contract. There's 96,000 contract opportunities. Why would I just go for one type of opportunity? That makes To me, that makes no sense. The second thing is the uh, 8A program has a nine-year run. So if your company doesn't have the proper connections, the proper resources to develop how as quickly as they want you to want your company to develop during those nine years, it's a wrap for you. After you fall out those nine years, you can no longer be a part of the 8A program. So that's those are stipulations that I don't like. And then most of the time when you get the 8A certification, they don't, they're supposed to help you throughout. But I've heard and physically seen myself because I had the 8A certification. They don't even start to try to help you until like year six or seven. And it's a nine year run. Now I only got two years left. Why are you now just helping me? Now I'm now I can't even use probably use it. So I'm not a big advocate for 8A at all. Oh wow. See, that is the real right there because I don't think enough people is, are breaking it down that way for you, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just that 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 connotation of it. It's like, oh, 8A, yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta get it, right. gotta get the 8A. Right. You just gave the real, and I appreciate that. I know the as soon as people mention the 8A, they associate it with the 10 million, the 30 million, the 40 million dollar contract. Mm -hmm. But if your company can't handle a 10 or 30 or 40 million dollar contract, they're not giving it to you. They're not awarding you. Your company has to get built or developed to be able to handle those type of contracts. Ooh, there we go, bro. There we go. Okay, so. We are getting to wrap it up now. This has been a very interesting conversation. Oh, man. It's, it's going to be easy anyway. You're my dog. You know what I mean? You know, you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. a simple because, you know, we already feed off of each other and we go back and forth on different things, man. And and, and the people really resonate with our messages. So um, the, the key thing that we got to talk about, All right. I am creating a trillion dollar table, right? Ooh. I might have mentioned this to you before. I'm not sure. Jeez. But the trillion dollar table is a challenge. Yes, sir. By the end of this decade, so by 2030, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. we are going to put together a room, a table where all of us in it, and even better, most of most of you know the people yeah. in it look like us, yeah. are going to have a trillion dollars assets under management, AUF. Now, some people hear that and they, they get scared. Trillion dollars, that's insane. I'm excited. Listen, what we're doing in, in the space right now is only limited by how big we want to get it. Mm -hmm. Government contracting, how much money do, do they spend on uh, government contracts each year, the federal government? Like like 65 billion would it be? It's like 65 oh. billion dollars. That's a year. Every year. That's a year. Yeah. So you could get contracts that's laying out for for multiple years and those are kind of your assets under management but then what you do with those contracts and the money you're making from your government contract is now you're going to get a real estate now you're buying other businesses but now you got investment portfolios yes, this sir. is all assets under management and you could the same things that it takes to buy a one million dollar business it's the same thing it takes to buy a one billion dollar business mm. it's actually easier to get the billion dollar business than it is to get the one million dollar <laughs> so with those things in place with the people like you and myself and the ones that we have in our network 
Yeah. Are you going to be part of this trillion dollar table? Yes. What? Yeah. That's a no brainer. When, you, when I hear the word trillion, T, trillion, I, I, yeah, I definitely get excited. That's, that's, obviously we know that's life changing. Obviously, obviously we know uh, it's generational wealth, all of that. Cool. But the fact that we can sit down and strategize to create that table by creating that within ourselves. Come on, man. Like that's, that's exciting. That's like, yeah, let's go get it. Yes, sir. That's yeah. what I love to hear, yeah. man. That's, so I'm, we're going to be looking back at these episodes. Yes, of sir. You know what you've exposed in 2030. We're going to be like, okay. Yeah. Where we at? Let's where we go. at? Where, <laughs> <laughs> where we at, baby? You know what I'm saying? I love it, I love it man. Hey, so tell, tell the audience where they can find you, where's the best place to contact you and anything else that you'd like to end us off. Yeah, man. So the website, of course, thefederalcode.com. You go there. I got my calendar in terms of my next event. I got my courses up there and all the other services that I offer as well. And just some fun facts about federal government contracting as a whole. And then you can hit me up on my IG, you know, at I am Jason White underscore. You check me out. You talk to me, I'm going to talk back. Now, my brother B's like, all right, Jay, you keep saying that. Your DMs going to be crazy. My DMs are crazy. But I get to them. You know what I mean? I get to them when I'm in the gym, when I'm in the sauna. And that's just me talking to you because I... This is how I personally feel, bro. You know this. If somebody take the time to reach out to me, I'm going to try to, my best to find the time to reach out to them. Whether it's a quick little voice note, I'm just saying, hey, what's up? Thanks for the appreciation of the love. Like, I think that's important for, uh, for us as the new leaders of influencers to just do it a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. 100%. That, that shows that you're an upstanding guy, that you, yeah. you know, considerate for those who are uh, invested in themselves yeah. by working with you. That's right. right. So uh, that that's definitely a great characteristic, man. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why you and I uh, connect so well and continue to rock together. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, before we drop off, I do see one last question that I want to get answered to. Okay. Uh, somebody just asked that they just got a new LLC. And can they get into government contracting or do they got to wait like six to 12 months? Oh, I love that. So that's why I always say federal government contracting. Because there's another two, there's two other levels, state and then local. At the state and local, they put that red tape on y'all. Yeah, you gotta wait two years, you gotta wait, you gotta have this and have a create a DBA and all that. Nah, 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 nah. Federal government, like, yo, you created your LLC? Great, congratulations. Now register that into Sam.gov. That's all you gotta do. Obviously, you still need an EIN number, but you register your, your LLC and your EIN number into Sam.gov. That's all that's it. That's all you need. Ooh, there we go. There we go. You can create an LLC last night and register that thing this morning. It's like that. There we go. There we go. So uh, one last thing. You guys might have seen the, the, the names below our boxes pop up, but I think there's a misspelling there for Jay's uh, IG. So just so that you know, it is I am Jason White underscore. Yes, I, I am. am. Because right now it just says I'm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I am. I, I am. am Jason White underscore baby. There we go. There we go. Hey, bro. Hey, as always, man, it is a pleasure conversing yeah. with you, just being in the same room, just, yeah, you know, just chatting and planning and, you know, talking about the things that we know we're going to do. It's always great collaborating with you, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, uh, pouring value to, to the listeners. Yeah, man, man. Much love and appreciation. And I wish you the best in everything that you do, bro. For sure. Entrepreneurship exposed, man. Thanks for having me, man. Let's go. Thank you, bro.